Hey guys, and welcome to the first build video of my homemade CNC. The CNC has a five foot by five foot torsion box top. This will allow a half sheet of plywood to be cut at a time and a maximum material thickness of six inches. The whole project cost under $900 to make. I have free plans to download as well as a cost breakdown spreadsheet with links to all the products I used on my website, diybuilds.ca. So without further delay, let's get started by building the table which supports the CNC and all the electronics underneath. It's go time. So here you can see what the shop looks like before and after I made room for the CNC to go. The table for the CNC only uses one sheet of 5 8 MDF and one sheet of 3 quarter inch plywood. I had that sheet of plywood ripped down into smaller pieces at the big box store that I could then break on the table saw down to four and a half inches. Next it was off to the miter saw to cut everything down to exact length. If you want the exact dimensions yourself, you can go to diybuilds.ca and download a free set of plans. The legs are comprised of two pieces butt jointed together with glue, screws, and nails. To create the upper and lower shelves, I first mark out where the boards need to go and attach them temporarily with glue and brad nails. I then come back with two inch screws two on each slat. The top of both shells, which is identical, is comprised of 5 8 MDF, 4 feet by 4 feet each. It's attached with a lot of glue, a lot of screws, and a lot of nails. The MDF was not exactly 4 feet by 4 feet, so I came back with the flush trim bit. To start attaching the legs, I first flipped over the top shelf on its top, marked out on the legs where I was going to apply glue, and then checked everything with a square before firing in a few brad nails. I then came back with four 2-inch screws on each side of each leg. I cut some scrap wood spacers in order to put down the bottom shelf at the exact height that I wanted it. Now getting the shelf up here was very tricky by myself and a bunch of the spacers started falling down. So I kind of had enough of that and drove in some brad nails to keep them in place. Once the bottom shelf was sitting on all the spacers, I lifted up one side at a time, applied glue to where the thickness of that shelf was going to be, and then dropped it down again. I then drove in four 2-inch screws on each side of each leg. And that's it for building the table that the CNC sits on. I just had to move it off the assembly table without killing myself and get it into the corner. Now I found out the corner is very uneven so I later shimmed three of the legs. The torsion box top is made of three sheets of 5 foot by 5 foot 3 quarter inch Baltic birch plywood and also a little strip off of a 4 by 8 sheet of 3 quarter inch plywood as there was a little more needed and the rest of that sheet will be used for the gantry and other parts. <laughs> 
So rather than fussing with three pieces and making sure they're all the same, I just took all three going in each direction and grouped them together with a couple screws where I knew it wasn't going to interfere with anything, such as the saw blades. So what I do is I head over to the chop saw and make sure everything is down to this final length. Then I'm going to mark everything out and then bring them over to the table saw and notch out the overlaps. So now that everything is notched out and cut to final length, I lay everything out and do a quick dry assembly. So now that everything worked great in the dry assembly, I can take it all apart and put glue in all the joints. And I am very generous with my amount of glue here. So I start laying glue all over all the top and I'm gonna slap down the five x five sheet of Baltic birch. I'm gonna use a square to make sure it's square and adjust all the inner pieces for the right offsets along the sides. So now I'm going to mark out exactly where all the ribs are underneath the top sheet of plywood so I can make sure I'm screwing directly into them with a whole bunch of two inch screws. I then give everything a light sanding just to get rid of any fuzzies or any little burrs that are sticking up. Then it's time to flip it over and do the exact same thing to the other side. This time while checking that everything is aligned and square, I can actually use a speed square on the side to reach the top and bottom to make sure that they're parallel with each other. Now the last two side pieces I mark in place and cut to length after everything is done because there could be some variances in the thickness of the plywood. This ensures that there's a perfect fit. So the last thing to do on the torsion box is to add the two pieces of DIN rail to either side. These are going to be our linear guides for the gantry. To install the DIN rail, I'm just using a jig to keep the spacing the same on the top, bottom, and middle. 
and everything is kept in place with a whole whack of one and a quarter inch washer head screws. Now, this thing ended up weighing close to 200 pounds, so if you can, find a buddy, give him some beer, and he should be able to help you out. So the gantry build begins like any other part of this, with breaking down the stock needed. The cut list can be found at diybuilds.ca. So the two larger pieces here are going to be the verticals for the gantry. The two smaller pieces are to add thickness and rigidity to the axles on the bearings. Everything is glued, held in place with some brad nails, and then a couple inch and a quarter screws to clamp everything down while the glue sets. I can then mark the location of where the bearings are going to be located and bring them over to the drill press and drill them out with a 3 8 inch hole. Now the 3 8 Forstner bit I was using left a little too much slop in there and I found that the spiral bit was a great fit. Now to mark the location of the lower bearings I first mark where it's going to go left and right and then I install temporarily the v-groove bearings and a little piece of rail and I can put another bearing and mark exactly where that hole is going to be. I trace out the inside of the bearing with a pencil and then I can line up a Forstner bit to that circle and simply indent the center of where it's got to be drilled out. The V-groove bearings are mounted with a washer on the outside, inside, and then on the other side where the nuts go, there's a washer there and then two nuts, one is a nylock on the outside, the other is a regular nut on the inside, and these can be jam nutted together to ensure this never comes apart. I then mark out and drill out where the half inch holes are going to go for the half inch bolts. Now I found using the half inch Forstner bit this time created a better fit than my half inch spiral bit. Now in the design I call for cutting off one of the corners and this really should have been done beforehand, would have made everything a lot easier. But just the same I brought it over to the miter saw, did as much as I could, finished it up by scoring the veneer and cutting it through with the jigsaw. After making sure that the bearings were working properly and the gantry was able to slide back and forth, I could then drill out my hole for where the motor is going to be mounted. This hole accommodates the raised circular section on the motor itself. Then I'm going to set up a jig with my router to cut out the size square that is required for the stepper motor to seat into. This is done because the shaft on the motor is only so long and it really needs to be sunken in to accommodate the pulley that gets mounted. After I get the motor sitting properly in there, I can use a self-centering bit to mark the location of all the holes. I then widen these holes out to accommodate a 1032 bolt and a nut on the other side. So I couldn't really find any good affordable pulleys for guiding the belt. So what I did here is I made a little jig with a hole saw to press down on the outside of a fender washer. This is a half inch fender washer so it'll fit on the half inch bolt and its little bent profile here will allow the belt to just kind of guide itself onto the bearings in between. Now there's no room for this to actually be jam nutted on but I am using a half inch nylock nut so it should never come off. And now you're about to see what happens when you don't double check your measurements. And now you know why there's two extra holes in the gantry. So next I need to mark out the height of where the belts are going to be tied off at each end. 
Once they're marked off, I can bring them over to the table saw, stack them all together, and cut all of these grooves at the same time. To attach these, I just use a temporary scrap on top to align it up. Then I just pin it in place with some brad nails and come back with four 2-inch screws. Just for a little bit of extra reinforcement, I cut out a little triangle, put glue on both sides, and tacked it in with some brad nails. One screw should keep it plenty secure. Now to rotate the unit and get my measurements for the length of the gantry. I don't want to go just off the CAD model, it's better to measure it in place because there could be a whole bunch of variations at this point. I set up a stop lock to ensure all four pieces are exactly the same length. To assemble the main beam of the gantry, everything is held together with glue, brad nails, and two inch screws. I then measure and using an angle grinder, cut the DIN rail to final length as it comes in 2 meter lengths. A few quick strokes of the file takes off all the burrs left by the angle grinder. I then clamp a couple of scrap boards up to the side that allows the DIN rail to be aligned perfectly with the edge. This ensures parallelism between the two rails. After the two ends are secured, I come back with a caliper to check the distances at both ends and in the middle. Everything is within a couple thou, so I just go ahead and drive in all my screws. I then cut a few spacers to hold up the gantry exactly where it needs to be placed. Just after getting this all set up and in place, I realized that I needed to actually create and put the z-axis in place before attaching both ends. I begin building the z-axis by ripping down four pieces of material. One will be the piece that slides up and down, two will be thickeners for the bearings to go against, and one is the back piece for everything to mount to. The two side pieces that act as thickeners for the bearings get glued down, tacked in place with some nails, and then screwed down to act as a clamp while the glue sets up. I can then mark out the position of the top two bearings and center punch a hole, then bring them over to the drill press to drill out the 3 8 inch hole. In order to get the position for the lower bearings, I simply bring it over to the gantry top, slide on the top, and set a loose bearing on the bottom to trace the circle. I can then drill out that hole at the drill press. After checking the fit on the bearings, I can then remove them, lay my piece on the table, and start assembling the linear guides for movement up and down. The z-axis is comprised of two linear guides and an acme thread in the middle with two pillow blocks on the end. This all came as a set for under $50. It also came with two couplers, of which I only need one. The linear guides are intended to be mounted with some machine screws, which I didn't have, so I just simply widened the hole a little bit to accept some number 6 wood screws. In order to make lining up all the guides easier, I'm going to cut a scrap piece of hardboard and hot glue it down to the bearings, making sure everything is aligned. Once all the linear bearings are attached, I can slide out the rods one at a time and bring it over and lay it on top of the piece that is actually going to hold the router. This is hot glued in place temporarily while I drill all the holes through the linear guides and attach some number 6 wood screws. I then test the fit to make sure everything's sliding freely and straight. I can then work on cutting a scrap piece of wood to use as to hold the nut that slides up and down the Acme thread. 
there's a little bit of a gap between the brass nut and the bottom of the wood. So when I push the Acme thread out to make the indent, I don't want it to sag. So that's all that piece is doing. I can then line up the Acme thread as straight as possible and smack it with a hammer to leave an indent, which I can then drill out on the drill press. With the Acme thread nut now installed, I can do final assembly and tighten up everything once it's looking good and working properly. The coupler that comes with the linear kit only has 8mm on one end of it, so I needed to widen out both ends to accept 8mm diameter. I then glued two pieces of wood. These are going to hold the motor for the Z axis movement up and down. It needs a large hole drilled out in the top of it exactly where the motor is going to be positioned as there is an indent ring around the stepper motor itself this needs to seat into. Also, in order to tighten the set screw on the coupler, I need to drill a small hole to accept the Allen key. Now that my helper has helped me install the top piece, I can use a self-centering bit to find the holes and install the motor permanently. I don't show it here directly, but the coupler is installed there connecting the Acme thread to the motor, and using the hole from earlier, I drive in both set screws. I then start laying out the piece that's going to be holding the router in place, and using my god-awful $5 hole saw kit, I burn my way through two holes. I can then bring it over to the bandsaw and finish cutting out the final shape. A slot is then cut in the end to create a spring effect and a hole drilled in the side which will accept a screw later to clamp down on the router and keep it in place. I then attach with four two inch screws the two rings holding the router to a half inch piece of scrap. It doesn't really matter the position of this right now as everything will be lined up when it's on the table. Next we can do final installation of the V-groove bearings which are installed bolt, washer, V-groove bearing, washer, through the wood, washer, nut, and then lock nut. And those lock nut and nut are jam locked together. I drove in only one screw on each end to act as a pivot point. That way I can twist and change the direction of the z-axis checking with a square against the table. After everything measured up square, I drove in all the screws in each end. Now in order to hold down the belt on both sides of the gantry, I just went with two screws through scrap piece of plywood to clamp down the belt against the end. Now as it came time to clamp on the opposite end, I made sure to pull down extremely tightly on the belts, tensioning them enough to about, let's call it an A note. I drilled some pocket holes into a few scraps of plywood to act as supports for the drag chain. 
One end of the drag chain is attached to the table and the other is attached to the gantry. Once the gantry is fully assembled, we can then cut a few pieces of wood, glue them together, and this is going to be the mounting for the x-axis motor. The first thing to do is drill the half inch hole for the half inch bolt which is going to hold the guide roller bearings slash pulley. I then take the assembly over to the gantry and z-axis and fasten it down with four screws. I can then remove that assembly in order to drill a 1 inch Forstner bit for clearance for the nut on the back. The guide bearing is then installed, bolt, washer bent outwards, two bearings, washer bent inwards, a smaller washer on the inside, and on the outside a washer and a lock nut. I then put the pulley on the stepper motor and then align it up with the guide bearing. This then gives me a measurement for how thick a standoff I need for the motor. The motor has a raised circular part, so I sand off one edge on both the standoffs. I place the motor on the standoffs and mark the position of all the holes that need to be drilled for mounting. I then temporarily mount the motor with two inch screws, which allows for a pointy service for me to mark the holes which need to be drilled for some three inch screws to be added after. Using the mounting holes from earlier, I reinstall the screws back into the assembly. I can then thread the belt through and test the function of it. Here you can see exactly how it snakes its way through this. Using a scrap piece of plywood, I set the router at the right position. I then drive one screw in. From here I can use a square to check the bit and make sure it's totally perpendicular to the table. I then drive in the other three screws. I then drill a series of holes to open up a slot for the belt to slip through the side. On the other side of the gantry, the belt simply wraps over the top and is fastened down. The same for installing the gantry belts, I simply tension it down and screw it down with scrap pieces of plywood. To install the drag chain, I take a scrap piece of plywood, drill a couple pocket holes, and then I can attach the drag chain to one end of that, making sure that it's totally perpendicular. One end of the drag chain is attached to the z-axis, the other end is attached to the top of the gantry and doesn't move. The last thing to do on the z-axis is to install a spacer block and then attach both over travel limit switches for the z-axis. As you can see the limit switch arm needed some re-engineering to activate. The last thing to do was to attach the y-axis over travels to the table and the z-axis over travels to the z-axis. So the first thing I do is break down a sheet of 5 8 MDF. This is going to be the wall to separate the unused section of the lower shelf and the controls cabinet, which needs to be sealed off for proper airflow. The cross members that support the table actually run perpendicular to this piece, so I needed to mark out and notch out those areas. In order to mount this dividing piece, I'm going to use some scrap plywood, drill a bunch of pocket holes in it. These will then get glued and nailed on and then screwed in place when the divider is installed. As I maneuver this piece into place, you can see that I'm using a spacer block to ensure that every section is spaced equally. 
Back over at the table saw, I ripped down another sheet of 5 8 MDF. This is going to be used to house the fan that cools the unit. Now I find the center, mark my circle, and then using a little trick I learned from John Heiss, I actually don't need to drill a hole to start my jigsaw, I just kind of plunge it in like that. The way I chose to mount this fan is just by taking the stock grill that comes with the fan and attaching it with a bunch of screws on either side of the cage. Now you see I had to notch out a few areas to make clearance for the inside. The outside cage gets mounted in the exact same way, just to protect little fingers. Once the assembly is in place, it's just held down with four inch and a quarter screws. So the last thing to do was to just take the controller that controls the speed on and off and just kind of mount it to the back wall. This will later get plugged into a power strip. Back over at the table saw, I'm going to rip down a few scrap pieces of pine. The wider piece of scrap pine is for the thickness of the air filter. The smaller piece is just an edge to keep it in place. So I'm going to install this piece on the bottom, and on the top there's just going to be a piece attached to the torsion box top. This will keep the right side free and allow me to slide new filters in and out. Using some more of that 5 8 MDF, I've ripped down a small section which is going to be used as the shelf to house all the electronics. When cross-cutting to final length, I have a small scrap that I cut nearly in half to add as braces for the shelf to attach at both sides of the table. This is simply glued, and then a few brad nails hold it in place. With the shelf now complete, I can start laying out all the electronics. Everything gets simply screwed down to the board, making sure to not over tighten anything. So in green and black, what we see is the four driver boards. In blue, we see in the middle, that's the controller which plugs into the driver boards as well as the computer. On the right in gray, we have the 24 volt power supply. The control board, I simply used a bunch of nuts as spacers to stand it up off the bottom, as I thought a little bit of airflow underneath couldn't hurt. The power supply also received a few spacer blocks just to increase airflow underneath the unit. I then temporarily hooked up a cheater cord providing 120 volts to the unit, which will then convert it down to 24 volts. I use a meter to verify these results. In order to begin wiring these up, I first needed to decide which driver boards needed to be X, Y, the cloned version of Y, otherwise known as A, and Z axis. Each of the driver boards needs 24 volts from the supply, which I use 16 gauge speaker wire to provide. The main control board does not need 24 volts, it uses a double-ended male USB-A to connect and get power from your computer. Lastly, I mounted and tested the relay, which is going to control the spindle on-off function. All the electronics, including the computer, are mounted underneath, so I need access. So I created a door out of Lexan using just a hinge and a piece of scrap Lexan. Once the Lexan was cut to final size, I could then lay the hinge where it needs to go and using a self-centering bit drill out all the holes. I then needed to mark locations for new holes as the old holes were the exact same spot as the ones attached to the Lexan. And this isn't going to work when the hinges are closed, they're going to interfere with each other, so everything needed to be offset. 
The hinge gets attached to the Lexan with some simple 832 nuts and bolts. I then whipped up one of my patented trapezoidal handles which I put on all of my shop furniture and attached it to the front with two holes to act as a handle to open and close the door. With the door now installed and fully functional, I take a scrap piece of plywood, rip it down to about an inch and a half wide and the proper length to fit between the shelf and the top. This is going to be used to add a window to the right of the door as the door does not stretch across the entire front. In order to power everything, I'm going to be using a power bar with a surge arrestor and an on-off switch. So to get the plug out of the unit, I needed to drill a big hole in the bottom to run it outside. The power bar was then screwed down so it didn't move. Using a couple spacer blocks at the same height on both sides, I can then drop in the shelf with all the electronics in it. Once the shelf was seated properly, I drove in two screws on either side, one into the leg, one into the dividing wall. A total of six things get plugged into the power bar. The fan, the computer, the computer monitor, the 12 volt adapter for the relay coil, the 24 volt DC power supply, and the power from the router which goes through the relay. I then installed four magnet latches all around the door in order to keep the door closed. I then bent up and drilled a hole in a scrap piece of aluminum and mounted my e-stop push button. I then taped together all the cables that needed to go up to the gantry and started fishing them through the upper drag chain. I then took a scrap piece of pine and then started drilling some holes through it. This is going to be then ripped down and these will be used as clamps to hold all my cables in place. As I attach a clamp on the front of the z-axis and the top part that doesn't move, I'm sure to leave a little loop of wire for movement. So the cables I ran to each servo are actually 8 conductor 22 gauge. I decided to parallel up my conductors in order to lessen the voltage drop. All the connections are soldered and heat shrunk together. Using my heat gun with this blade worked, but it was a pain in the ass, so I took it off and decided the traditional way works fine. After the connections were all made, I simply pulled the slack back through the drag chain. As you can see, the wires are just kind of hanging out the back right now, and I want them to come through the side of the gantry. So using a series of holes and rocking my drill bit back and forth, I created a slot for all the cables to pass through. After pulling all the cables one at a time through the top, I can then start pulling them one at a time through the lower drag chain, which will eventually make their way into the control cabinet. I made up a few notched out pieces for spacing away and holding the cables in place. I drilled a couple holes through the side of the gantry underneath the main beam where the two motor cables were going to come for the y-axis. So once everything's clamped in place, I added a few pieces of electrical tape to just hold everything together. And now you can see under the main beam where those little clamps are that hold the cables in place. So in order to get all the cables inside the control cabinet, I chose to drill a hole through the leg and through the bottom of the drag chain at a certain point to run all the cables inside. <laughs> 
Another notched out piece clamps all the cables down and some silicone fills in the gaps. So the first thing I'm going to do is get a 4 inch PVC pipe, which I use all over for my dust collection, and I'm going to heat up one end of it, as I need this end to butt up nicely against the router and get as close as possible. So I'm going to heat it up and then flatten it with a block of wood on top and a block on bottom, just to keep it kind of straight, because you can see as I push down without the piece in the middle, it actually wants to buckle in on itself. So clamping these two pieces together is really going to give me a nice flat surface. The collar on the router sticks down about an inch lower than the mounting bracket for the router. So the PVC pipe is one inch longer and I'm going to bring it over to the bandsaw and chop off the one side closest to the router as to increase airflow on that side. This PVC pipe is going to have the hose going in the top and the opening on the bottom to suck. So in order to mount this PVC pipe to the Z-axis, which slides up and down, on the top I'm going to be attaching a piece of wood with a couple screws to the PVC pipe directly. On the bottom, I'm simply going to go in from an angle, drive a screw through the PVC pipe into the Z-axis. The next step is to modify the pipe going over to my miter saw station. I'm going to insert a Y-fitting here and branch off over on top of the CNC. I simply cut in, cut away as much as I need to, and then install the Y fitting with some PVC cement. I get a lot of questions and concerns about using PVC cement, but for me, it's not really a big deal because if I ever need to change anything, I'll just cut it apart, add a coupler, and re cement it again. The PVC pipe will elbow down towards the CNC table, somewhere around the middle of the table. Now I'm going to be running a 4 inch flex hose down from that directly into the pipe. Now you can see I didn't quite have a long enough hose, but a coupler in the middle works just fine with some tape. And a little trial run shows just how much suction this thing is going to be capable of. Now that the dust collection is complete, I need to add a blast gate to turn it on and off. So I cut two 7 inch square pieces of 5 8 melamine, and then I'm going to cut up some hardboard strips. This is 8 inch hardboard, and it's going to be used as the spacer and the slider mechanism, as well as some little handles. If you're looking for exact dimensions, you can go to DIYbuilds.ca and look up my dust collector video. You can also watch my dust collector video building several of these all in different kinds of configurations. The first step is to use three staples on both sides to attach the guides and using the slider as a spacer in between. Then I'll take the top piece, put it on top, and drill four holes in each corner, being sure to look out for the staples and to make sure I'm drilling through the guide. Then I'm going to mark out the location of the hole, drill a pilot hole, and bring it over to the scroll saw and cut it out to final size. Now I test the fit and it looks good. So I can put the slider in, put one of the handles on for correct spacing, drop the PVC back in place, and mark the inside of the pipe. This is going to be the size of the hole for the sliding mechanism. Now that the hole is cut in the sliding mechanism, it's time to glue on the handles onto both sides. This just requires a little bit of glue and some light clamping. Once the glue is dry, take off the clamps and test the function of it. Now if you were smart, you would have installed the blast gate beforehand. I am not, so 
we're gonna have to retrofit it here. So I cut the pipe in half, put my two pieces on, and using a Sharpie, I'm gonna mark the pipe and the blast gate on both sides to make sure that it lines up correctly with the four holes when I'm done attaching the pipe to either side of the blast gate. Both sides of the blast gate are attached with four screws through the PVC into the melamine. Before reassembling the blast gate, I make sure to put the slider back in place, drive the four screws, and then it's time to add some silicone around the edges. I then cut up a small scrap of wood, which is going to be used to trigger against the limit switch, which we'll install next. Two small screws are then installed to keep the limit switch in place. The wiring is then done off camera to connect the switch up with the rest of the circuit. So here's the wiring diagram for the CNC machine. Let's start from left to right. On the left here, we see the power bar, which is going to provide the 120 volts AC for the entire thing. The first thing plugged into it is some flying leads, which go over to our 24 volt DC power supply. This power supply feeds the 24 volts on each of the driver boards for the stepper motors. As you can see, it's wired up line, neutral, and ground your black, white, and green wires respectively. So all you need to do on the output side is hook up a wire from 24 volts, follow it to the 24 volts on the driver board and daisy chain it between it. The common, same thing over to the common and daisy chain it down to each board. The next thing plugged in is just the power for the PC. My PC is an old Dell and the reason for this is it can be a dedicated computer and it also has a parallel port on the back which is how the 5-axis CNC breakout board is operated through a parallel port. You can get other boards that are operated through USB. This is what I went with. The PC has two cables coming out of it. The parallel cable, which is plugged into the parallel port on the breakout board, and the back of the motherboard on the PC, and a USB-A male-to-male cable, which provides 5 volts to the board. Next up, we have simply plugged in the PC monitor. After that, we have the cooling fan. This is that big fan in combination with my filter on the other side that allows clean air to circulate and keep the driver boards nice and cool. Next up, we have an ungrounded plug. The reason it's ungrounded is the router is a double insulated tool, so it doesn't have a ground. So we're simply going into a 40 amp contactor with our line and neutral. Our line is gonna be disconnected by the contactor and closed when we tell the coil to energize. The neutral is never broken. Next up, we have plugged in as a 12 volt power adapter, which feeds 12 volts through our normally open contact on the breakout board, and the common provides power back through the coil, completing the circuit, energizing our coil, and turning our router on. This is done within the mock software to control this relay. So the next thing is our five axis CNC board. As you see our parallel port, our five volt supply, our B axis, which is not used because this is only a four axis machine, no need for the fifth axis. We have our spindle relay again. So down here we have all of our safety inputs. Number five is not used. One, two, and three are our X, Y, and Z axis limit switches, which are all normally closed. And then we have our e-stop and input four, which is also normally closed. This is done for safety. If a wire ever breaks, there's no way to shut it off. Safety circuits are always normally closed. So next up, we have simply just all of our connection points for our four axes. We have the X axis, the Y axis, the Z axis, and the A axis. As you can see over here, the A axis is actually a cloned version of the Y axis. So we have two Y axes, an X and a Z. The breakout board is connected to each one of the driver boards via a ribbon cable. It can also be individually wired to terminal if you so choose. So the driver boards again have 24 volts going to them for power, the common for the 24 volts. And then we just match up our step, dir, end, and five volts between the breakout board and the driver board. On the right, we have the B+, plus, B-, minus, A+, plus, and A-. minus. This is simply connected up to our stepper motors with a four pair 22 gauge shielded cable. The shield goes back to ground, and you can see the symbol here is for twisted pair. So we have two twisted pairs in this cable. It doesn't matter. We just need a shielded cable that connects up to the leads on our stepper motors.
Now my stepper motors, the B plus was red, the B minus was blue, the A plus was black, and the A minus was green. This may be different for you. Do not mess up this connection. And this connection is simply made between the flying leads and my cable with solder and some heat shrink. And that's pretty much it. All you do is just match everything up on the driver board between the motor and the breakout board. And everything over here is your power circuits. Okay guys, so this is the Mach 3 software that's gonna run the CNC. So we need to do a bunch of setup before we even start. So let's go up to config. Let's say select native units. And we're gonna select inches. It's already selected. Next we're gonna go back up to config and we're gonna to go to ports and pins. So everything here is pretty much okay. So next we're gonna go over to motor outputs and we're gonna enable our A axis. Then we're gonna change both of these columns to match what we have on our parallel port connector. So next we're gonna configure the input signals. We're gonna turn on the X plus and negative, Y plus and negative, Z plus and negative, and then we're gonna set the pin numbers. 10, 10, 11, 11, 12, 12. Okay, and then we're gonna scroll down until we see our e-stop. E-stop is set, we need it to be pin 13. All right, then we're gonna go over to output signals and we're going to set enable one, pin number one, and then we're going to enable output one and that's going to be active low. So it'll turn on when it's zero and pin 14. We'll control it. Next, we'll go over to our encoders. Everything's fine there. Then our spindle setup, everything's fine there. Mill options, everything is fine there as well. And we'll hit apply, okay. So now we need to go back into our config and we need to start tuning the motors. Now this is what's gonna tell it how many steps per inch. So you're just gonna have to tune your motor with what pulleys you have, what motors you have, and adjust this. You're gonna to have to keep measuring and readjusting. So for mine, it was 1,131 steps per inch. And I want my velocity to be 200, acceleration 20. We're gonna change this to three and three. And we'll hit save axis settings. And we do the same thing for the Y axis. Save axis settings. And the same thing for the A axis because the A axis is a clone of the Y axis. And now we're gonna to go to the Z axis, which is a little bit different because we're using that ball screw or Acme thread assembly instead of the belts. So the steps are actually gonna be one, zero, one, three, four. And the speed will be 40. Acceleration will be two, three, three, save settings. Okay, all done. Next, we're gonna go into general config and everything looks like it's set up okay already. Okay, so let's go back into config. We don't care about hotkeys, homing limits, or tool path. So we're gonna go into slave axis. This is where we're gonna set up our A axis to be a clone of what the Y axis is. So we'll go Y axis, slave axis, A. The other ones are set to none. There we go. And that's pretty much it for setting up your Mach 3 software. So now that everything's configured, all I have to do is attach my stock to where I need it, make sure that these screws that are holding it down, because I don't use any clamps or anything, make sure these screws aren't gonna be hit at any point with the bit, and then I can bring it over to its origin point with the arrow keys. And then I can lower the Z axis with page down. So now that I've moved the router to the origin point, all that's left to do is load our G-code and hit start.